Hi, Dr. Kevin Windish from Sparks Pediatric and Adolescent Medicine here. <clears throat> Welcome to our video series for students. Sorry about the huge delay between last video and this video, and sorry about the use of shaky cell phone technology. Uh, we've been having some technical difficulties here with our screen capture, and uh, I've been trying to rectify it, but Mm, so far, haven't had any luck, so we're resorting to doing this old school because I did want to get some of this content up. Uh, if you're a student looking to join us, give us a call at 359-7111. We'll be happy to have you for a rotation. If you're a parent, welcome to the video series. Please remember these videos don't replace visits with us. Uh, we can't help you over the cell phone or the internet, but we'd be happy to see you here. Just give us a call. So what I wanted to talk about today is two very common forms of um, malnutrition. This is something that's talked about on step one of the boards for medical students, and then it kind of gets glossed over again and nobody talks about it again, but it comes up from time to time in clinical practice. And that's the differences between marasmus and quashior core, both of which we see a fair amount of. So I want to take some time to go over this. Let's start with... Uh, the technical differences. Marasmus is malnutrition because of lack of nutrients. So it's considered protein calorie malnutrition. You don't have enough protein in your diet, you don't have enough calories in your diet. So the technical definition and what you'll see written on the boards is it is protein calorie malnutrition, meaning both malnutrition, meaning both deficient in protein and grams of protein per kilogram per day of body weight and deficient in calories. Uh, Quashior core is uh, protein malnutrition, but sufficient or at least subsistence calories. Clinically, why do we care? Well, patients with marasmus are thin, they're emaciated, uh, generally they're hungry although at extreme points you can start to shut down the, um, the thyroid or re-regulate the thyroid into um, kind of a, a chronic starvation mode. And when that happens, then the appetite does start to get a little bit suppressed. Patients with marasmus are actually a lot, I'm sorry, with quashior core are actually a lot more complicated to treat because they have, uh, they're thin, they don't have a lot of sub-Q fat, but they tend to have edema because they don't have protein, so they're not making albumin in the blood. Their oncotic pressure is low as a result. They have ascites in the belly, which can compress all of the internal organs and raise the uh, diaphragm, making it difficult to get a deep breath. They can have uh, fluid in the pleural space as well, um, so pleural, sterile pleural effusions. And then they get cerebral edema causing depressed sensorium. And with that, they won't eat even if they are hungry. And so feeding these patients is difficult. Now, in both cases, you have to watch the phosphorus in these patients and uh, reintroduce feeding slowly so as to avoid something called refeeding syndrome. I don't want to get into the details of how to refeed these patients or refeeding syndrome in this video that's outside of the scope of this video. But I did want to take the time to talk about the distinguishing features vaguely. Now what I want to look at is why do we here in the United States care about this? You say, I am never going to work in Africa, so I don't need to worry, right? Wrong. I work here in Sparks, Reno, Nevada, and I've seen multiple cases of both. So I'm going to give you some common scenarios and why you need to worry about these things because unfortunately these are not relegated to the third world. Now if you are working in the third world, if you're working with UNICEF, if, UNICEF, if you're working with World Health Organization or various disaster relief organizations going into third world countries, you're going to deal with a ton of this. Um, but they're going to give you training that goes way beyond the scope of this video, and, and that's okay, that's what those trainings are there for. Uh, this is kind of your primer. So why do we care here in this country? Let's look at marasmus first. The most common cause of marasmus is an eating disorder. So somebody with anorexia nervosa. 
because they're not going to get sufficient protein, they're not going to get sufficient calories, and so they're thin and they're emaciated. But we also see other causes of marasmus. We definitely see it in feral children who've been locked in rooms. We see it in children raised by uh, schizophrenic or drug-addicted parents. Not that all schizophrenic or drug-addicted parents do this. In fact, most manage to make sure their kids get sufficient food. But we definitely see it in parents with severe mental illness or severe... Uh, um, drug dependency. Uh, but in cases where everything psychosocially is normal, where, where do we see it? Uh, the most common case is going to be um, in a child with severe gastroesophageal reflux disease. And I've seen this a couple of times where the kids come to my office having suffered from gastroesophageal reflux disease that's severe. And it's not necessarily coming out of their mouth. So it's not grade four reflux. They're just refluxing into their esophagus. But it's so severe that they have marasmus. I've also seen it in missed cases of cystic fibrosis. Because if you can't absorb the calories, if you can't digest the proteins, if you can't digest the fats, you will develop marasmus. Uh, I've seen it in cases of severe long-standing congestive heart failure because those kids have higher caloric needs and they suffer when they try to eat, especially if they're bottle fed and they're drinking liquid. The liquid sends them into worsening heart failure. And the act of sucking on a bottle is very difficult when you have borderline oxygen um, distribution capacity because of heart failure. And so those kids can go on to develop marasmus. Now, the differential is huge, and we could go on and on and on about this, but this is some of the more common scenarios and kind of the things you want to think about and why we don't just rule out marasmus here in this country. We do see it, and we see it a lot. Question your core. This is definitely one people tend to think of in the third world. Um, you know, these are cases where uh, – don't have access to a lot of food, but you have access to rice, which is essentially devoid of um, protein. And so they're on a pure rice diet and they develop kwashior core and beriberi. We're not going to talk about beriberi, but you get that from deficiency of certain vitamins that are deficient in rice. Um, but what about in this country? Where do we see kwashior core protein? malnutrition. Well, we see it in kids, and, and again, this is not universal, but we see this in infants whose parents are vegan who try to make the infants vegan. This does not mean you can't have a vegan baby or a vegan young child. It absolutely can be done, and it absolutely can be done safely. But it's absolutely difficult to do, and you have to watch the protein intake carefully. And when you have parents who aren't as educated about veganism as they think, especially if they're kind of new to the vegan movement, that creates a lot of difficulties. More commonly, we see this in kids who are fed diluted formulas or worse yet, uh, sugar water instead of formula as an infant or instead of breast milk as an infant. Uh, mom has chosen not to breastfeed. Mom's not available to breastfeed. Mom can't breastfeed because she's got hepatitis C or HIV or not around or substance abuser. And family members can't afford formula and they either don't know about WIC, women's infants and children, or uh, don't have the sense to go to WIC or who knows what the issue is, don't qualify for WIC. But they give um, sugar water. Or sometimes with the really young infants, kids under 9 to 10 months of age, they'll feed them whole cow's milk instead. It may not sound like such a bad thing, but cow's milk has too high of an osmotic load. It results in osmotic diarrhea. That osmotic diarrhea draws with it the protein and the fat, especially the protein before it can be broken down and absorbed and often results in protein malnutrition. I've seen that twice again here in Reno, and the two cases of Kwashior Kaur that I've seen have both been kids uh, who were fed cow's milk at a really young age. And um, in one case, the child was fed exclusive, when I met him, was being fed exclusively cow's milk at six months of age. And um, he came in dehydrated. When we hydrated him up, he became severely edematous and went into heart failure. And as we were starting to 
to work him up in the hospital to figure out why he was in heart failure. Uh, it became apparent to us that he was on an exclusively milk diet at home, and that's when we kind of put the story together. And we're able to fix his problems with dietary intervention. Uh, so, kind of the take-home message here is these things do happen here in the first world, um, and they happen a lot, and you do need to be cognizant of them. We're not going to talk about refeeding. That's outside of the scope of this here, but you can't worry about refeeding until you've made the proper diagnosis and you can't make the diagnosis unless you consider the disease. And if you think of it as exclusively a disease of the third world, you'll never consider it and you'll absolutely miss something that's not necessarily all that rare. So I hope this has been enlightening to you. Hopefully I have some better graphical videos soon for you. Uh, if I can ever get the screen capture technology issue worked out and we'll see you next time.